Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Karthik Baluri. I'm an assistant professor at, for cardiovascular critical care medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Today, I'm here to talk about our experience with COVID-19 in a critical care aspect. Um, the primary focus for me is to shift it toward perfusion and ECMO. Prior to getting to ECMO, what have we faced? So this is our talk. This is part one. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee will be joining me next after right, with his insight. I will be talking about the pathway to ECMO. So a quick epidemiology, all of us have been inundated with COVID facts. You know, it's all over the news, it's all everyone talks about, and we're also facing it as a, as a population. So general mode of trans transmission, we know that it's respiratory droplets. You know it's contact with infected service. However, now recently that's been debated by the CDC. Airborne aerosolized respiratory droplets, which can be seen during procedures that we see like in the units, like uh, BiPAP or any type of uh, airway related uh, procedures. If you have coronavirus or if you acquire it through these methods, it usually takes about four to 14 days for it to have presenting symptoms, after which there's a progressive course and there's different outcomes. Um, overall, what the way we control this infection is through contact and droplet spread, uh, prevention, with simple masks, eye face protection, six, three to six feet of uh, distance, social distancing, and different agencies like WHO and CDC have you know, different requirements. Overall, this, this is a very severe disease. However, uh, majority of the patients, and these statistics range between 60 to 80%, only suffer a mild form of it. However, there is the component that gets progressively worse, and this is about three to six week course for these patients with a severe form of COVID. So how does COVID-19 lead to respiratory failure. The overall aspect of this virus is that it infiltrates, we respond to it, and then sequentially we get worse. There's an asymptomatic state followed by our upper airway tract symptoms, and then slowly our hypoxia and our changes in our radiological imaging set in. What are these events that take place? It's a very busy slide, but this is a graphic representation of the various cascades and processes involved within our alveoli in our lung. Now the virus binds to everyone's possibly heard about the ACE2 receptor, um, which is lining majority of our um, alveolar respiratory tracts, endothelium, cardiac, myocytes, it's in the brain, it's, it's found in the GI tract. It's a pretty prominent and widespread receptor. So it's a potential target. But for this sake and for this virus purpose, our respiratory tract is pretty much where it sort of shows tropism toward. It attaches, infiltrates our cell, and it triggers a massive inflammatory response. Now, the inflammatory response for this virus is uh, determined predominantly individually. Like, not everyone has a clear-cut, cookie-cutter response to it. Some people can deal with it, and they'll have mild symptoms that'll go away. However, our problem with respiratory failure starts here. As our host responds to the viral infiltration, progressively gets worse, it leads us into different situations in which um, uh, macrophages, antibodies, um, uh, interferons, interleukins, all these inflammatory modulators start eating away in basic terms at our respiratory tract and our functional unit of the lungs, which is our alveolus. This is where oxygen is being transferred from uh, our air that we breathe in into the bloodstream. So it's a very vital component to our existence. And that's why this is such a um, severe disease. So just in general, um, these are some of the findings that we've seen. CT has been shown to be a better modality in detecting uh, changes re uh, in, re in regards to COVID-19. Um, certain patterns, which are, these patterns are present in other disease states. However, in the clinical context of you acquiring this condition, you being tested positive for it, or you presenting with exposure to it, if you find these findings, it's, it's pretty indicative of potential and progressive respiratory failure. You have ground glass opacities, and that's the opacities you see there in the, in the corner. Then you'll see patterns like crazy paving, uh, which is like these, um, the cobblestone appearance, and it's like, uh, it's like the roads that you see. Vascular dilatation, so this is the other component of your lungs, the blood interface. You'll see uh, the vasculature also being affected by this virus. You see something called traction bronchiectasis in which these uh, airways get really stretched and enlarged and ultimately lose their functional purpose. As of May 21st, re, uh, very recently, uh, New England Journal of Medicine released an article um, sort of cataloging the changes of this virus, um, uh, gross morphology and microscopically, like pathohistology. So one new component they've seen a lot is something called endothelitis, 
basically our endothelium, with, uh, which is the cells that line the inside of our blood vessels are just extremely inflamed. That's one. Uh, the next thing they've seen is microthrombi, and this has been passed along a lot, that there's a lot of microthrombi formation in this alveolar capillary interface areas, um, in which this, all, all of this, all of these issues, all this inflammation, it ultimately leads to one simple thing. Oxygen that comes into our body needs to get put into our lung because of all this inflammation, all this endothelitis, these thrombosis, and all these other secondary effects to the host response that that barrier uh, is created and that interface where oxygen can easily be transferred from air that we breathe in put into our blood is destroyed the severity of how much this occurs in different types of people uh, is dependent on the host factors that means if you're susceptible to it we don't know exactly which conditions make a certain person susceptible however um, we do know the general things of age, heart disease. Uh, we see it less in children, they say, but we see a different form now. Um, and other comorbidities associated with this has shown to have a more severe outcome. So what do we do? This patient comes in, and now you know how this virus um, affects us and how it infiltrates our lungs, how it causes the inflammation in our host system, and then it ultimately messes up our ability to oxygenate our blood. So over the course of the last three months, um, there has been three major issues that have been associated with COVID and critical care medicine. Number one, understanding what it is. And that is an ongoing process by doing studies from Wuhan and everywhere else. The next thing that, what do we do and how do we prepare for it? How do we protect our own people and staff? That's another focus. And then the biggest thing was, what if we have a, a increased amount of patients that surpasses our hospital capacity, which is the surge, which we circumvented? Majority of external factors took place like mitigation strategies. Uh, we tried containment, uh, like contact tracing and stuff like that. But these mitigation strategies with social distancing, quarantine and everything has led to a slowly flattening of the curve as of now. So our ICU luckily in Houston, uh, here in St. Luke's, uh, wasn't inundated. We were able to handle the capacity that we got in. However, that's just one aspect of this entire thing. The other aspect of this is, okay, Versus another respiratory failure patient, such as with COPD or you know, so pneumonia, how does COVID defer and what do we do? So we've established amongst the collaboration with pulmonary uh, critical care, cardiovascular ICU, anesthesia, surgical ICU, group of um, uh, critical care doctors and administrators, everyone's got together and created a agreed to format, which basically uh, sets a few rules and protocols and if a patient came into our ICUs and how do we treat them? Once again, this is important to remember, oxygen needs to be delivered to the blood. How do we do that? First step, we isolate them, droplet, and make everyone safe, healthcare workers and, and the patient himself. We initiate low flow oxygen, which is one to six liters of oxygen to see if their oxygen saturations are going above 92%. Time goes by, and as this inflammation is occurring in that patient's body, he's requiring more and more oxygen. Now we would escalate to something called a non-rebreather mask. And this is approximately 15 liters uh, per minute and there's no humidification at this point. Simultaneously, this patient would be transferred from a different aspect, from an from a, from a investigation room to a critical care isolated unit, uh, and that would be happening to that patient. The, the, the next major thing is something called heated high flow, or heated humidified high flow nasal cannula, and it's called Vapotherm, is a brand name. Basically, this delivers a high liters per minute, like 40 liters per minute, a lot of oxygen into the body. Now, this method is debated whether Every institution is different. Some institutions say don't do it because it increases aerosolization. However, we believed it worked if, as long as we were in a negative pressure room, made sure all the precautions and barriers are done. And this would prevent us in the setting of COVID progressively getting worse and causing further and further impending respiratory failure in these patients to improve oxygenation and maybe pull them out from the edge. If that didn't work, then in case-by-case -case selected basis, we would use BiPAP or CPAP, the mask, the non-invasive positive pressure uh, ventilation. Fine. COVID is eating away at the lungs. And all of these experimental treatments that are under clinical trials right now, like convalescent plasma, remdesivir, tocilizumab. Uh, so these treatments will be ongoing parallel. But as they're ongoing, we, and hydroxychloroquine, right? So as they're going um, parallel to this, we don't see any improvement in oxygenation. What else do we have left but to intubate the patient? And that's where the ultimate uh, step comes in from the medical ICU um, and our 
oxygenation strategies. So when would we intubate this patient? We've tried all of these methods. Now we're at an oxygen saturation despite maximum level of treatment, including Flolan, proning the patient, which is a completely different topic, but proning has been shown to help. We see a O2 less than 65, SAO2 less than 92% on, all, on high flow nasal cannula. We see the patients in respiratory distress, respiratory rate greater than 30. CO2 is building up, building up, uh, and his patient's getting more acidotic, his pH. Impending respiratory failure with metabolic variations despite maximum uh, capacity to supplement oxygen is when we would intubate this patient. We don't wait that long till it hits that point. A clinical day-to-day -day decision and patient-by-patient -patient decision is made to intubate the patient. Fine. COVID is continuing to eat away at the lungs. We're unable to oxygenate. We've intubated to force air into their lungs to get it into their bloodstream. So this acts and this behaves in a radiographic manner uh, as something called ARDS. ARDS has been around for 60 years now. Now, the, the thing with ARDS is it's, it's a broad umbrella term. Um, it basically says that your balloons, uh, sorry, your lungs are supposed to be like balloons, but now in the case of COVID or ARDS, they're like cement blocks. And that's what we have to try to oxygenate. So over time, there's been different trials and strategies that have been um, accepted. Now, what are these strategies? PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure, is the amount of pressure you push inside the lungs to keep the airways open. That is a very important um, parameter that we can adjust with the ventilator. We try to increase PEEP, keep the airways open to deliver more oxygen. Tidal volumes, okay? We try to uh, maintain a low tidal volume uh, in these patients to protect it from trauma or barotrauma, pressure trauma. It's a strong recommendation. Other small technicalities we see within mechanical ventilation is plateau pressures. We want to keep it under 30. Um, if we want higher peeps, we have to determine based on a severity scale, um, ARDS severity scale, um, if it's severe, we increase peep. Other methods have been tried and not been proven, such as different ventilator uh, strategies, such as APRV, uh, inhaled Flolan. Um, but overall, it's been generally recommended to avoid steroids in these patients. We prone them and we try all these strategies associated with ARDS to increase oxygenation to the lungs. Most of the time, we are successful. Most of the time, we face a lot of other secondary issues like super infections with bacteria, renal failure, volume overload. There's different things that are happening. But once again, the basic thing comes down to this. We need to get oxygen into the bloodstream. Now, we have tried everything from nasal cannula to high flow nasal cannula to mechanical ventilation, but we are still at a point where we are not oxygenating these patients. What do we do then? And that's when the pathway to the ECMO comes in. And this, this decision-making is usually determined by the ECMO intensivist, an interventional cardiologist, a referring MD, cardiovascular surgery may be a part of the decision-making. This is all institution-based, but our institution protocol, Dr. Chatterjee, is uh, gonna discuss um, our experiences here. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to him. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Shubhashish Chatterjee. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon and critical care intensivist, as well as the ECMO program director here at Baylor St. Luke's. Today we'll discuss ECMO for respiratory failure in the COVID-19 pandemic and our experience here at Baylor St. Luke's and the Texas Heart Institute. So the ECMO services that we provide here fall into two broad categories, cardiogenic and respiratory. The most common indications are postcardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, postmyocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, decompensated heart failure, ECMO in the CPR or salvage settings, and those cases to support our VAD and heart transplant patients. On the respiratory side, it's typically for ARDS, for pneumonia, to support uh, both lung transplant candidates before and lung transplant recipients after their procedure. And the incidence that we use ECMO for respiratory failure currently is about 20%. Over the course of our Baylor St. Luke's experience, we um, uh, typically uh, do somewhere around 120 cases a year um, in terms of um, our overall volume. And this you can see represents about a 25 to 30% increase over the course of the last three to four years. What you'll also notice is that about three or four years ago, we had very low survival. Uh, approximately one-fourth of our patients, both in respiratory and cardiogenic recents, uh, actually survived. And at that point, when I became program director, one of the things we looked at was 
what were people dying from? And what we found was that we had a high incidence of neurologic in bleeding and uh, complications. So we set about programmatic initiatives to reorganize the program, focus with uh, other specialists in terms of neurologic outcomes, redo our anticoagulation protocols, and improve our patient selection. And you can see over the course of the last three years that our overall survival has jumped from 26 to 47%, and our respiratory failure in particular now is over 60%, uh, approaching that of the ELSO database. The way we do ECMO is that we have ECMO uh, conventionally in our 32-bed CV recovery ICU. This is where all the cardiac surgery, liver transplant, and mechanical circulatory support patients go to. All of our ECMO is done in the CV recovery room, and that's whether it's for cardiogenic shock or for respiratory failure. We begin with nursing at a two-to-one ratio, and then it's one-to-one -one nursing. Um, and then finally, we start with four-to-one ECMO specialist, uh, which is a perfusionist. And if we go above four ECMO cases, then we bring in a second in-house dedicated perfusionist. And there's always an LVAD, ECMO, and staff intensivist uh, in-house 24-7. When, as we were getting ready for the COVID surge, we took a lot of instruction, not just from international societies like ELSO, but also that of other thought leaders around the world in terms of what they were seeing. And I think at this point, our first response to the way ECMO was is that there was a lot of concern because the initial reports that came out of China showed a really prohibitively high mortality rate. This is a uh, series of uh, multiple centers, only 17 total ECMO cases, but you'll see here that the mortality for ECMO cases was 94%, and that's compared to a 70% mortality for conventional management. So these patients were highly sick, and the truth was in these patients, ECMO didn't really seem to make much of a difference. But at this point, talking to colleagues, both uh, Asian and European colleagues, talking to patients that had experienced the pandemic earlier and at a higher intensity level in Seattle, New York, Baltimore, and then talking to local other ECMO uh, centers in our area at Houston Methodist and Memorial Hermann, we set about trying to rationally formulate guidelines and organize the program within that. And institutionally, we used various intensive care unit services, CV surgery, as well as colleagues in perfusion and nursing and respiratory therapy. A critical thing that had to be decided early on was how were we going to be able to provide uh, PPE and provide uh, and care for our providers to make sure that uh, caregivers were not unnecessarily exposed. And we sort of divided an ICU to, as you can see, a green, yellow, red zone with various degrees of PPE required uh, in each zone. And so as a result, we converted one, uh, we actually had one dedicated uh, COVID ICU that was just for ECMO. At a maximum, we were up to three ICUs, uh, three 12-bed ICUs that were dedicated to ECMO. But various parts of the ICU would be organized into sort of a green safe zone uh, a yellow sort of transition zone where more PPE was required, and then the red or the patient rooms where full-on PPE would be required, as can be seen here. We were able to bring out some of the equipment, not the ECMO circuits themselves, to be able to limit the amount of exposure that different care providers would have going into the rooms. So instead, we still, during this phase, during the ECMO surge, we still did most of our ECMO in the CV recovery when it was for cardiogenic shock or for uh, post-cardiotomy shock. We uh, did, however, convert 6 Cooley A to a dedicated COVID ECMO ICU. The same CV recovery ECMO nurses who were down there were dedicated, and then they came up to 6A as a dedicated COVID ECMO nurse. Uh, none of the nurses switched during shifts, but they were all focused within that. We had a dedicated separate ECMO specialist uh, 
dedicated to the COVID ECMO uh, cases, uh, managing up to four circuits. The most we ever had was six circuits at the same time. And we still had our 24 seven in-house ECMO intensivist who would be managing all the ECMO cases, not just in CV recovery, but also in the COVID ICU on top of working with a dedicated intensivist focusing on just the ECMO cases. So this is what our ICU looked like. We had our uh, monitoring outside the room and just like that. The indications we used for ECMO really didn't differ much from the uh, landmark EOLIA criteria. These were guidance and set from, from, else, uh, from ELSO itself and basically was characterized by refractory hypoxemia or uh, hypercapnia, uh, non-responsive to conventional measures. The guidelines that we use, that we develop, were sort of multidisciplinary, and I think that helped to sort of help uh, to universalize the adoption. In general, we were offered ECMO to patients under the age of 60, I should say 60-ish, uh, patients who were me mechanically ventilated no more than seven days were denied, uh, patients in multi-system organ failure or those with significant comorbidities were cases that we avoided, uh, as well as uh, prohibitively high risk scores. So how this was this decided? Um, this was decided in the ICU, the in-house uh, COVID intensivist will call, call the uh, ECMO intensivist, uh, uh, and any uh, consultation also uh, required the ECMO director or the critical care or CVICU service line chiefs so that there was a team and sort of a consensus developed at which point the um, uh, various cannulation uh, uh, procedure uh, procedure list was uh, consulted uh, and then we had a formal uh, call schedule in terms of delineating who would be cannulating and decannulating and managing complications. So this is a little bit of what our experience looks like. So over, I think the best sort of metric is taking a look at what uh, the number of mechanically ventilated patients were. So we had, we've had 50 mechanically ventilation patients as of May 20th, subsequently 12 of them actually uh, cleared virus and became COVID negative. 14 of these patients are currently inpatient and ventilated right now, which represents about 30% of the overall cohort. Nine patients so far went on ECMO for respiratory failure. You'll see here that represents 18% of the mechanically ventilated cases. Overall, of all the 50 patients, 14 have died, which represents just under a 30% mortality, and about 19 of them have been discharged alive, either to home or to LTAC to date. Now, this is data, we've done nine ECMO cases. This is data for seven. Um, the for last two just sort of were on just the last few days, so it's sort of incomplete. But I also use this to benchmark ourselves against the uh, extracorporeal life support or organization or also in their registry dedicated to COVID. So the average age of our patients was 45, maybe just a little bit younger than uh, the ELSO registry evenly split between men and women. The prevalence you can see here of various comorbidities are listed. Uh, not a huge, uh, and it's impressive. These aren't patients with a ton of other medical problems by and large. Um, and you can see the rest uh, from there. With respect to disease-specific demographics, on average from the time patients uh, started symptoms to the time they were hospitalized was about five days. And from the time symptom onset to intubation was just about six days. So once they arrived in the hospital, they tended to deteriorate relatively quickly. From the time they were intubated, in general, we average about within four and a half days of ECMO initiation. And, and uh, our longest was about eight and a half days after initiation of ECMO. You can see here uh, where we are relative to the ECMO, re the ELSO registry. You can see this was a sick cohort of patients. So on average, people uh, over 15, a PDF ratio of about 80, uh, and by and large, heart function was preserved. You can see here the adjunctive measures that were used. Just about everyone uh, was prone, got uh, prostaglandin E2, uh, were paralyzed on steroids, and uh, a number of them got various adjuvant uh, therapies uh, within the, uh, uh, that were uh, COVID-specific. In terms of cannulation configuration, most of these patients were fem-fem cannulated. Three of the patients were uh, cannulated with a dual lumen Avalon uh, catheter, uh, one patient actually started out VAV, converted to VV, 
um, and was our longest uh, case. He was on for 41 days before he was successfully decannulated. I think I wanted to, I want to just take a step back here and just make sure that from an anticoagulation standpoint, this is where I think it's really important to have uh, progr programmatic infrastructure and understanding. So we discussed that one of the things that really improved the protocol was to, uh, the program was a uh, dedicated heparin monitoring protocol that was understood, that was coordinated with the help of our heme path colleagues. Um, and so we published this data uh, a, a few years back. We looked here, basically the way we manage anticoagulation is typically we would aim for a PTT in these COVID patients, typically somewhere between 65 and 75. We would check it every six hours. This is consistent with what we had done previously. Um, we managed the thromboelastogram, the prolonged art time. We were aiming to be therapeutic there. The way we did things is when there was discordance between the two, the PTT and the TAG, we sort of used the anti-10A level as sort of a tiebreaker to, uh, to make sure we were in the right direction. Uh, we tried to keep anti-thrombin-3 levels greater than 50%, but definitely between at least greater than 30 to 50%. And if we suspected HIT, then we uh, would switch to bivalirudin uh, for anticoagulation purposes. This shows that, uh, in general, the HIT and the, the and PTT and the TAG are rarely discordant, probably about 35 to 40% of the time, where they actually concordant, which is where the 10A becomes important. And it sort of underscores why we can't just rely on the PTT in ECMO cases. And this was what we published before in terms of our clinical outcomes. You can see significantly uh, improved uh, bleeding uh, complications, and most dramatically, a pretty significant reduction uh, in more mortality, most importantly. So going back to the COVID cases, you can see here, this is the inter International ELSO Registry. As of last week, there were about 935 cases uh, worldwide, um, of which uh, we've contributed nine so far. And uh, these are our outcomes. So eight out of nine patients have survived. Uh, the average runtime was 16 days, uh, which is longer than what the ELSO registry reports. Like I said, our longest case was 41 days. We had one patient die of an intracranial hemorrhage uh, at eight days. Um, and here you can see the uh, other data with the VVA patient. So finally, uh, I think one of the other things to emphasize is between myself as the ECMO director at Baylor St. Luke's and uh, at Houston Methodist uh, and Memorial Hermann, we sort of formed a consortium to be able to like discuss our, our joint ECMO experience, to be able to discuss uh, things that are working, things that are not working in real time. And here you can see that uh, the collaboration between the three centers, we've done a total of 34 cases with very good outcomes, about an under 9% mortality outcome. And if you compare that to the ELSO registry that has about an 18% mortality outcome, uh, we've done pretty well so far in terms of uh, practicing ECMO here. So with that, I think the important points that I really think I'd like to emphasize is that with respect to COVID ECMO, um, it's really important to be flexible. And I think that um, along those lines, it's re recognizing that ECMO is a team sport. And what it really requires is excellent perfusionists, um, uh, people like Rashid Moody and, and Adam Harshman and all of our colleagues within perfusion have done a great job being flexible and working within that working with our nurses to be able to make sure that we can do this at a dedicated way and to do this uh, as safe as possible. And, and in real time, I mean, there's no playbook for how to do COVID ECMO. Um, we had to sort of discover this on the fly and, and everybody wanted to do the best job they could for their patients. Um, and as well as working with our intensivist colleagues to be able to, to work this right away. I think one of the unique challenges about this time was that it's important to set the family expectations. Normally, there's always an opportunity for a face-to-face um, -face encounter. And I think that was probably the big challenge. I think it was really important to either get on the phone, and I tried to make it a point to FaceTime uh, at least once or twice, a couple times a week, um, to be able to see that. Because I think sometimes your nonverbal communication and just being able to look at another person's eyes really tell something. Uh, and it's, a, it, it's certainly one of the biggest challenges. Uh, but it's something that if you're focused, I think it certainly can be done right. And I really think this is underscores to get the process right. We discussed anticoagulation, and I think that we, the steps that we had taken over the last couple of years to get the anticoagulation right really helped in the COVID situation. We didn't have bleeding complications, because mainly because we kind of knew how to do this right. 
Uh, it's important to be deliberate and thoughtful. Remember, every time you get a lab test, you're sending other people in to, uh, you know, to, to, to risk and to exposure. So I think we were thoughtful and deliberate about that. And I think that's important. And with that, um, that's essentially it. So we'd be happy to entertain any questions.